This lecture is going to focus on molecular transit. So we talked about cells having a semi-permeable membrane that's composed of phospholipids where you have these polar heads and nonpolar tails and it creates this nonpolar region all the way around a cell. That's really important because it allows for this concept of uh, selective permeability. So, you know, all in the cell and all out of the cell, you have solutes, right? It's the stuff that's getting put into water. And all of these solutes have a gradient. So we're going to be talking about concentration gradients. So what you can do is you can pick a color and think about what the gradient is. Now, all molecules want to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And that happens spontaneously without energy. So every second of every day, molecules, solutes, are wanting to move from high to low. Always, always. And if the cell doesn't want that to happen, then it's going to have to do something about it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's look first at um, solute concentration gradients. So let's go ahead and pick, let's say, this dark brown. So here we have some sort of an organelle within this cell, and you can see this dark, kind of reddish maroon color. There are um, a lot inside, and if we just look inside the cell, there are fewer outside. Now, don't just look at the total number. What you're doing is you're looking at the concentration relative to the space. So don't just count dots when you're trying to figure this out you're going to want to look at the relative space related to the dots. And you can see that it's more concentrated inside than it is outside. And so these are going to be wanting to go that way. Now, they don't have minds of their own. They're not actually trying to leave. What happens is when they're condensed like this, they're going to be bouncing off one another, right? And because of that, they're going to be pushing themselves slowly out and doing what we call diffusion. Right? So they're going to be diffusing out of this internal compartment into the outside of the cell. Okay, so let's pick one more color. Let's look at this uh, orange color um, as compared to inside the compartment. So outside to inside, you can see that orange wants to go in for this direction. And you can also see that there's another concentration gradient with orange moving out. So high concentration here, low here high concentration here, low here. All right, so the other thing I want to make note of is that solutes, you know, uh, have concentration gradients, but the solvent does too. And I want to be clear that I'm always going to use this negative space as the solvent. So of course that's water. So water always has a concentration gradient as well. And when we talk about that, we're going to be talking about osmosis but I'll save that for a little bit later, okay? All right, so molecules don't just um, get to move wherever they want, they actually have to be transported. And so that's why you have these proteins embedded in membranes. So one more example of concentration gradients. So if you have this drink mix, uh, something like Kool-Aid that you put into water, you know that even without stirring, these guys are going to be bouncing off one another and spreading out into the glass. And it's the same thing inside of cells. Um, it's just that there's a membrane there. All right, so this is an overview of where we're going to be going. Uh, so so transmembrane transport, so just moving molecules across membranes, you can either do it passively like I was just talking about, where you have simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion, and this just means that, you know, facilitate to help. So you're just using a protein to help get these guys across from high to low. And this is without a protein, just right through the membrane, and that is moving high to low as well. So it falls under the passive umbrella. So both of these have to be high to low. And then within facilitated diffusion, you don't need to worry about either of those. So we're just going to ignore that and we're going to stop right here where passive transport is either going to be simple or facilitated. We can also do active and this is from a low concentration to a high concentration and that is going to take energy.
Okay, let's take a look at how this works. So your first type of transit is uh, simple diffusion. Okay, so that's right here. And there are three types of uh, molecules that do this. So water, oxygen, and CO2. You're just gonna have to memorize that. Um, they're small, and in two of the cases, they're nonpolar. But water's pretty so small, even though it's polar. And so what happens is, let's start with these two. They always follow their gradient. So, and they're so small that they can fit through the heads. So oxygen, as we talked about in a previous lecture, O2, is, that's a covalent, nonpolar covalent bond. So these are nonpolar, but because they're so small, they can slip through the membrane. And then they have no trouble with the tails, and then they can slip through the other side. Carbon dioxide does the same thing. It can slip through. So this is extremely relevant um, for something like exercise, where your muscles need immediate oxygen and they need to get rid of CO2. Well, it's really helpful that they don't have to wait for something like a carrier protein so that they can just literally zip down their gradient. So as cells deplete oxygen, oxygen would continue to come down its gradient and into cells naturally without using any sort of energy to do it. So diffusion high to low. And CO2, as it builds up in the muscle bed, it would be diffusing out of the cell and into the blood, um, going in the opposite direction as oxygen. Now water is in this list, and this is a big issue. We're gonna do a couple of activities in class on this. Water always follows its gradient, and that is actually a problem. It is polar, so it doesn't like these tails, but it's so small that it's able to slowly, not like oxygen and CO2 where they zip through down their concentration gradients, water slowly moves its way through the membrane and goes out the other side. So there's, you constantly have a slow leak of water in and out of cells. And so what cells do is they have to move other things in order to get water to go the direction they want. You don't want cells to shrivel up. You don't want them to get so big that they go ahead and pop. Um, and so osmosis, which is the passive movement of water, is a really big deal for us. And we're gonna talk more about that Okay, so simple diffusion, right through the membrane, water, oxygen, CO2. Facilitated diffusion is your second category, and so facilitated diffusion is still diffusion, right? So it's still high to low, it's just that you're using a, a carrier protein or a channel protein. Um, and so we're gonna lump these together. Essentially, you can see that it's high to low, so high concentration of sugars, low concentration high concentration of amino acids, low concentration. So types of things that go through facilitated, facilitated diffusion are things like ions, so like the hydrogen ion. That's something that we're gonna use. Um, it has a full-blown charge on it. Water's just partial, remember. Hydrogen ions have full-blown charges and they do not like these tails, so they cannot get through. So what they would do is just diffuse down their gradient, but this channel, of course, has to be open. So cells can close off these channels and in that way they can regulate what's coming in and out. Not so for these though, right? You can only regulate here facilitated diffusion and of course active transit. Okay, so ions do this. You can also, let's say that you have um, a really dehydrated cell and you go ahead and drink a lot of water because your, your cells are dehydrated, you're feeling that really strong thirst. What water can do, instead of waiting for water to slowly leak into cells, these channels can be opened up and water can rush in. So water is on your list. Other things are things like monosaccharides, amino acids. They've got a charge on them and they're a little bit bigger. Active transport is when energy is used to make something go from low to high. You can see here, low concentration to high concentration. And that definitely takes energy. So that energy source is going to be ATP. And when ATP binds with the protein, that allows for a solute molecule that bumps into this to be shot through to the other side. And so cells will do this to move um, things like particularly ions um, in order to create gradients.
okay, which we will relate to bigger concepts in class. The last type of transportation is called bulk transit. You don't need to know the word exocytosis or endocytosis. Don't worry about that. We're going to call this bulk transit. And this is anytime you have a lot of something or something really big, like a full grown protein. Um, you know, you saw this when we moved the protein from the ER to the Golgi, right? I mean, it's too big. It's bigger than the transport protein in the membrane sometimes. And so that protein, you know, or this, uh, you know, a group, a big group of hydrogen ions, those are going to be, that vesicle will fuse with the membrane and spill its contents outside or inside the cell. This can go either way. So this vesicle is just simply phospholipids. It's like a mini cell membrane within a cell that can carry things. And uh, here's kind of a, a cool image of, uh, um, uh, in this case, this is a macrophage. So this is an immune cell um, engulfing a yeast cell. So this is, could be considered endocytosis or bringing something in. But again, bulk transport, just bringing something in. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is osmosis. All right, let's draw a couple cells. There's some terms you need to know. Um, uh, when I talk about, when I draw dots, remember that that's always the, sol, uh, the solute, right? And the negative space is always going to be water. So in this instance, I'm drawing three different, uh, well, two different concentrations and one isotonic cell. So can you see that this is isotonic, which means that there's an equal number of dots inside and out. These terms always relate to the dots, by the way. And here I have a hypotonic cell because I have a low number of dots on the inside and I have a hypertonic solution because I have a high, relatively high number of dots. So anytime a cell has fewer solutes inside the cell versus outside the cell, then it's a hypotonic cell and a hypertonic solution. And then you would have the inverse here, hyper, hypo. So those terms you're going to need to be able to play with. The other thing that we're going to be doing in class is figuring out what the heck is going on with water, right? So osmosis is the passive transit of water. Water is just so important that it gets its own fancy term. Other things diffuse as well, but, um, but water is so important it gets this fancy term. So all of these terms, hypo, hyper, um, iso, those are used, those are going to be used in our class to figure out what's going on with water. So if we think about what, what's going on with water here, you need to look at the negative space for water. And I just can't emphasize that enough. When people start looking at the, the dots as water as your solvent, then you get into trouble. So water is in a high concentration out here. Can you see that? So there's relatively few dots, so that means there's more water on the outside. And on the inside, water is at in a low concentration. And water, you know, is just like anything else. It's going to move high to low. It's not something you can contain. It moves right through the membrane. So water is going to be slowly leaking in that cell, into the cell. It's the inverse here. You have high water on the inside and low water on the outside. And in this case, this is a happy cell. Water is moving both ways. Okay, so that's an introduction to osmosis and some of these terms. We're going to practice with these in class, and that concludes your lecture on transit.